Juist in deze onzekere tijden is het belangrijk om elkaar te blijven ontmoeten, te informeren en te inspireren over hoe we het morgen slimmer en beter kunnen doen. Welkom bij de livecast van Pakhuis de Zwijger. Welkom at de VPRO Tegenlicht Meetup. On behalf of Pakhuizen Zwijger in Amsterdam and VPRO, the Dutch Broadcasting Company. Edition number 171, brought to you as a live cast, focuses uh, is, is, uh, is named Corona Vergezichten and deals with the perspectives after Corona crisis. Uh, the next hour we will talk about the idea that there's an opportunity to reset the world, to reset our economic system. But at the same time, this crisis is experienced by different people in completely different ways. There's people who sort of have the luxury to rethink their own habits and to uh, think about how this well opportunity can uh, can be uh, obtained. But at the same time, there's of course a lot of people who really suffer from the crisis and uh, uh, have a hard time getting by. Um, this framework and this uh, these questions are discussed tonight with a uh, uh, um, high level. Panel, if you ask me, first of all, uh, Kate Rayworth is with us. Uh, she's well known internationally uh, from her book uh, Donut Economics, and she's an economist also at the University of Oxford. Um, uh, she joins us via Zoom, and Marlene Stickers with me here in the studio. Uh, she's founder and director of WAG, an Amsterdam based organization focusing on emerging uh, technologies for social change. And with me as well is Saada Norhusen, uh, editor in chief of One World magazine. Welcome both. Um, and in a minute uh, or two, I will start the evening with a short Q&A with Frank Wiering. He is producer and uh, director of the VPRO Tegenlicht documentary that is uh, broadcasted every Sunday evening on Dutch public television. And maybe a few more words on the uh, concept of these uh, meetups. Uh, if you're not familiar with the concept, um, each Wednesday evening we elaborate and we deepen on the documentary that was uh, broadcasted on these uh, Sunday evenings. And we do so with uh, invited guests and with the audience. And uh, well, the whole idea of broadcasting a live cast uh, is, of course, to uh, to have participation with the audience. Um, but if you, in case you haven't seen the documentary, don't worry. It's quite easy to participate and to follow the discussion. Um, and before we officially start, maybe a few more practical remarks on how to participate. If you join us via Zoom, it's quite easy. The Q&A button gives you the opportunity to ask questions to our panelists. Please uh, clearly state for whom the question is uh, is uh, is meant, so we can uh, address the right person. And via the chat function, you can ask general or technical questions to our hosts. Um, so that will work uh, uh, if in that respect. Um, and if you don't want to uh, participate and just follow the program, you can also uh, join us via the traditional live cast or via our Facebook channel. That for an introduction. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Frank Wiering, director and producer of the documentary. Frank, welcome. Hello. Hi Frank, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my first question would be, how did you get the idea to take this specific angle on the uh, on corona crisis? Well, after a couple of days of the crisis, I realized I'm living at a farm, that there were no planes in the skies anymore. There were no white uh, uh, lines uh, on the highway that people were driving less. And uh, when I went to the city, it, was, it started to become very relaxed. And I realized that if you want to leave uh, the world, this planet, for our children and grandchildren in an orderly way, that was exactly where you had to get. And I also realized that politics and uh, the uh, politics couldn't do that because in a democratic system, if you would say uh, we stop flying, uh, people would vote for another party and you start flying again. The only place where you could do this is in China, where you can where, uh, where you can tell people not to fly anymore. So suddenly, this crisis felt like an opportunity, but it also felt like something what, that we could learn from. So that's when I started to look around, and there were more people who say this, and I found an interview with Lidlbe Edelcourt, who said the same thing. I'm happy about. Uh, this crisis 
Ja, ja, dus voor een short uh, introduction voor de people who haven't seen it. In your documentary Dirk de Wachter is uh, interviewed. He's a psychiatrist and leader by Edelcourt, a trend forecaster for the fashion industry. Why did you uh, specifically invite these two uh, people, two, um, uh, two persons, to, um, uh, to reflect on the crisis? Because uh, leader by Edelcourt is in the fashion and design industry, but not only fashion design, he's doing more. And I realized that she could talk very well about what this means for the global system because uh, fashion and design is after uh, uh, oil and finance the third global trade in the world. There's so much money going around and there's so much trade going around. All these ships filled with uh, uh, rubbish that go to the primary. So she was a good, good one. And Dirk... Uh, could reflect on what this crisis and also the isolation we're living in now does with the psyche, psyche of a society and a human being. And he did that very well. Okay. In in Dutch newspapers, there was uh, a bit of criticism or quite a bit of criticism on, on the documentary in the way that especially Lidewey Edelkort is framed as, as having the luxury to sort of uh, uh, reflect on on the opportunities the crisis gives without having the, the 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 downside of the crisis, as I just highlighted: people having lost their jobs, entrepreneurs struggling to uh, maintain their business, and even worse, people losing uh, people within their uh, environment because of uh, health uh, issues. Of course, um, how would you react on that criticism? Because, well, what, how, how, what is your opinion on that? Well, the criticism is partly correct, but if you say people from a luxurious position cannot reflect about on the crisis, even if they're part of uh, the global system, you cannot interview anybody anymore. Okay. But you you don't feel she needed a bit of a reality check within the interview on, 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 on those sort of, well, struggling issues a lot of people face nowadays? You either talk about the position now of people struggling, or you talk about the, 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 uh, what could happen after the crisis. You have to realize that in World War II, there were million, millions of people dying in concentration camps and in war, and still they were talking about what to do after the crisis, after the war. Mm -hmm. And they came up with the Marshall Plan, which was a very good idea. It changed the world. You have to realize that. Okay, thanks. On a final uh, note, um, uh, uh, it struck me that uh, the interview uh, w uh, with Lidewe Edelkort uh, took place in South Africa. I think from, from the, the, the uh, uh, correspondent uh, living there, Bram Vermeulen, I think. Uh, yeah. it, do you think this model could work for future documentaries, maybe made by VPRO, to uh, cut on uh, air uh, uh, traffic, and, and not from a financial point of view, but from a climate point of view? I think it was a very good idea because we uh, we communicated through uh, the internet and through uh, Zoom, which was very good. And I even with the the, the girl I always edit with, uh, Christine Houdier, uh, she's the only one in, in the Netherlands who has a, an Emmy. Uh, we I sat at home and she sat at home, and we edited both from our house, uh, and it worked perfectly. Okay. We'll do that in the, in the future. I want, to, I want to do it always. Okay. For a closing remark, thanks a lot, Frank, uh, for joining us. Okay, graag dan. Um, going uh, on with the program, uh, as a short introduction for our panel discussion, we have three topics within our panel discussion. First of all, we will focus on, uh, on how the tr uh, crisis can transform our ways of consumption. Secondly, uh, how can we combat inequalities and, and focus on international solidarity in the longer run? And thirdly, how do we look at the notion of freedom uh, uh, within this uh, crisis? Uh, each uh, topic is shortly introduced with a clip uh, from the documentary. So let's take a look at the clip number one, where Lidewey Edekort uh, says she expects consumption will dramatically change after uh, this deep crisis because international production change uh, are broken. There's a window of opportunity to redesign our production process. Maar de moderne mens is verslaafd aan zijn, aan zijn goederen, aan zijn kopen. Dus denk je werkelijk dat dat 
gaat gebeuren. Ik bedoel, of, of op het moment dat het virus alweer wat minder wordt, gewoon weer terugvallen in een oude patroon. Ja, ik kan me vergissen, want dat gebeurde steeds. Weet je, dat heb ik een aantal keer meegemaakt. Maar ik heb de indruk dat uh, door de marktwerking uh, de val zo groot wordt dat, ja, dat we echt teruggaan naar de, naar de 50 jaren bijna. Qua speelruimte. We krijgen een uh, maatschappij zoals na de oorlog. De gebouwen staan wel. Er is geen bom gevallen, maar er is... allerlei andere infrastructuren zijn weg. De airlines zijn failliet. Het toerisme zal een ongelooflijke klap krijgen. En dat gaat niet in één keer weer beginnen. Het is niet zoals in 2008, dat je na zo'n crash die alleen maar financieel is... en eigenlijk alleen maar virtueel is, uh, weer opbouwt. Toen was er niks aan de hand met de productiesystemen en zo. Nu is dat allemaal is het verbroken. En de optimisten zijn optimistisch omdat ze niet echt weten hoe productie in elkaar zit. En dat weten ministers niet en presidenten niet en zeker president Trump niet. Dat uh, de tijd nodig is om productie te maken. En die tijd is dus er niet omdat alle fabrieken gesloten zijn. Daardoor zijn ook alle basismaterialen niet aangeleverd, want er is geen transport. En ik denk dat, uh, dat daar een sleutel zit voor de verandering van de maatschappij. Want als we begrijpen dat die ketting dus doorbroken is... En dat het best moeilijk zal zijn om die weer op te zetten. Kunnen we ook denken van, laten we dan anders produceren. Laten we dichter bij huis produceren. Laten we vooral minder produceren. Want waar hebben we al die shit voor nodig? Welcome back at the VPRO Tegenlicht Meetup. Talking about uh, perspectives after corona crisis. Starting our panel discussion with Kate Rayworth. Um, donut Economics and the Economist at Oxford University. Marleen Sticker, Waag, based here in Amsterdam. And Saada Norhussen, uh, editor-in-chief of One World Magazine. Um, our first topic is how can this crisis transform our ways of consuming? And I'd like to highlight that people at home can uh, ask their questions via the Q&A. So please do if you wish to participate. Going straight to Kate Rayworth. Kate, uh, uh, Welcome. Um, my first question would be, uh, how does this crisis transform our ways of consuming? How, how, how do you look at that topic? Well, it's great to join you. I'm a big fan of uh, taking licht, I have to say, and the meetups. <laughs> the first thing that's happened, obviously, is that we have been prohibited from meeting in public. And so consumption, people's purchases have been stopped by force. And it's really important to remember that what's happening right now is not a lifestyle change. It's by force, by obligation. And for many people, it's causing absolute desperation in, because they've lost their incomes, right? On one side is a purchase, on the other side is a livelihood. And when these things fall apart, it's terrible for people whose livelihoods depend on that. So this is forced. And as we could hear from what Frank was saying, for some people, it's a reflection on What was I busy buying? And did I need to buy those things? And how am I coping now without those things? And actually, am I finding ways that I'm quite enjoying responding without them? So certainly here in the UK, I'm seeing many people taking great pleasure and relief in going to their allotments, a, a patch of land that's given to them by the council where they're growing vegetables. And suddenly realizing this is actually an incredibly important part of their lives. They're surrounded by nature. They're growing their own food, that reconnection of consumption and production. But we need to think also about long supply chains. Uh, people are no longer going out and buying clothing. What's happened to the workers at the other end of those clothing supply chains? Workers in Bangladesh are not being paid. And so we need to recognize the deep interconnectedness of global consumption and the two sides of this transformation. I, I, the last thing I want to add here is that I've been on bike rides with my children just as a means of here in the UK, we're allowed to go out for exercise. So I've gone on bike rides with my kids. And the thing I notice is the advertisements at the bus stops. And some of these advertisements are for absolutely ridiculous things. You know, a Cadbury's cream egg, which was something that I ate as a child. So 40 years on, they're still marketing it to us, trying to reinvent it for Easter. The, the frivolous nature of so much advertising that is forced daily into our faces, 
for me, has become very, very clear when we have retreated in our own homes and in our lives into what's essential, which is care and community and food and health and connection. And then we look at the adver advertising that has purchased so much of our city spaces and we really feel disconnected from it. And I think that's a very important moment to realize that we have been living in spaces dominated by advertisers convincing us to buy things we just don't need. And do you think that feeling of disconnection with the things we used to buy is something structural or or because uh, uh, there's a lot of people saying that, well, after Corona crisis, we will uh, happily continue what we've been doing for the last decades. And I think it can go both ways. I mean, let's remember the, the First World War was followed by the roaring 20s, the decadent lifestyle of champagne and flapper girls and living it up. So there is definitely a bounce back that people sometimes express after a period of prohibition. And I think there's also many people who are more deeply connected and recognizing that this crisis isn't just a one-off, it's a pattern, it's part of nature telling humanity, you are pushing too hard on my boundaries and it's so deeply connected to climate change. So some people are recognizing that this is part of a deeper pattern and really reflecting on the way they are living and realizing that they can make changes that they actually may prefer. So I think we'll see a mix of both of these. Okay, thank you, Sarah Norsen. Um, how do you look at this uh, opportunity to really, um, well, change our ways of, uh, of consumption? Do you think that's a realistic uh, uh, consequence of Corona crisis? Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to, uh, to uh, um, emphasize that I'm a journalist and not um, um, I ask questions, I don't have answers. Uh, but what I see around me is that, um, of course, people uh, shift uh, the things they value now. I mean, they they start to think about, you know, connection with people. And once that's cut off, of course, you start looking at all the stuff you have around you and how much you value that. And maybe uh, you have put too much value on that. Uh, but at the same time, I think people are still ordering online. Uh, uh, online companies are, are advertising heavily um, uh, on social media, uh, telling us to stay in shape and buy equipment for the house. And um, even in my street, I don't have many stores in my street, but there's one um, a plant shop that nobody ever went to. And now all of a sudden, all the hipsters, hipsters have gathered there and uh, not respecting the, the social distancing. And um, so this has become um, a, a pastime. I think it takes a long time for us who have been conditioned to consume. I mean, we have been raised to become consumers. Um, and like Kate said, this is not something that we will uh, from one day to the next stop doing. Uh, just because um, it has to be by force, like Kate said. But at the same time, um, I also think that you'll only stop doing that when you have the knowledge on why you should stop doing that and why this is connected to um, uh, to a crisis. Um, so if you want to seize this opportunity, you really feel we should uh, uh, also educate people. That is more uh, more uh, 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 it's, it is more necessary to to really take this opportunity. Yes, definitely. I think there needs to be much more uh, information about how your spending and your consumerism is connected to this and is tied to these problems and how it has been tied to these problems for for people uh, across the globe in places that we don't even know for a long time for decades for centuries maybe um, so uh, when Lido by Edecourt says we need to go back to the you know to the level of the 1950s uh, with our the way we can you know we can consume and 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 the things that will have available to us uh, I think she'll just I think she kind of forgets that even in the 1950s, there were people being exploited and places being exploited and nature being exploited. This didn't just happen now. Um, okay. So, yeah. Thanks. Marlene, going uh, to you as a first uh, question. How do you look at uh, structural possibilities of changing our consumption patterns? Well, as, uh, as uh, Kate says, it's forced on us at the, at the moment. And um, I think a lot of people also feel a bit relieved that they don't have to buy stuff uh, all the time. And uh, of course you can have a little joy in, especially the inner city when it's empty and you can have like the fresh air in the city. 
but uh, but I also feel an enormous urge and 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 a feel of this is a momentum that we should not uh, let go because I really am afraid that that we will restore the order that was and that's also the the companies that are there to to get the support from the governments are the ones that are all part of the old industry that we should not have back. So I I'm not I don't feel like in in the in the documentary Lidia Edelkort says well we, now we can start knitting. I think no, no knitting at the moment. We have to take this opportunity and be very very clear. How do we make sure we seize this we seize this opportunity because because we don't want to let it go by. Uh, uh, we feel sort of a uh, momentum. Uh, how do we make sure uh, we seize it? Well, I think at the, f at the moment in, in the Netherlands there are four different campaigns to uh, convince the government that they should not spend the money on companies that are of the old economy. Four different ones. Uh, I think so. We th we really have to group together. I'm 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 missing out on 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 a strategy uh, that binds these stories together. Um, and has a real force. Uh, I don't see it in a political arena. I don't hear these voices. And there's a sort of like, uh, I think a lot of people are now a bit uh, trying to not misuse the crisis. But I think, I mean, this is the moment to be very clear what kind of society we need and want. Uh, and, w and a society which is also sustainable. And so I think this, this is a very, very urgent moment. Yeah. And if we don't take that moment, if we don't take that action now, I'm afraid that we will go back uh, in in because we have we are in debt. But we need There's a, a huge amount of money spent, and we as society have to c come back with the money yeah, yeah. in the future. So this is a grab of the future to the now. But you're saying we need but a current idea, we need a concept that uh, takes us uh, where we want to go, and that's obviously where Kate Rayworth comes in. Uh, hopefully, I think. W w do you think this is an opportunity for the donut economics as well to really uh, uh, start working? I saw on Twitter you're really asking people if they see uh, examples within their own uh, uh, environments, if if uh, donut economy uh, uh, at work. Uh, can you reflect on that? For sure. Uh, Marlene is saying, let's not go back to knitting. <laughs> One thing we can knit, though, is donuts. I ah. have a little green knitted donut right here. Uh, yes, this is a moment. So we, we are in crisis, and when we go into crisis, it's crucial to go into crisis mode and deal with the immediacy of emergency. But as Marlene says, if we only focus on the emergency and then think we're just going to build back to where we were, we transform nothing. And actually, things get transformed. Naomi Klein wrote this fantastic book, The Shock Doctrine, that said during crises, actually powers secure their interests, further their interests, privatize more, increase their leverage over others. So it's crucial that we are here already saying, OK, as we emerge from this emergency, what are we going to emerge into? And actually, the most brilliant thing that's happening right now is that today is the day that Amsterdam launched the Amsterdam City Donut. This report, well, it's not a report, it's more like a tool yep. that we've developed together over the past year. It downscales the donut to the city of Amsterdam for the first time. So it's the first city that has published its downscaled donut. And this is a tool for asking this question. How can the city of Amsterdam be a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? That is a question I believe all places need to be asking themselves. It's about having high local aspiration for who we want to be as a people and a local ecosystem and recognizing that every city is embedded in a network of global interconnections with people all over the world and the rest of the living world. I'm okay. so pleased that it's Amsterdam that's running with this question. There's the Amsterdam Donut Coalition been launched today, which is an amazing coalition of change makers already putting the donut into practice. So yes, now is the time for having big visions. We need to reimagine and rebuild the future from local to global of the places where we live. And this is a crucial opportunity to do that. Thanks. A first question from the audience. Um, Anonymous is saying to uh, asks, uh, frames it as consumption is jobs, uh, less consumption is less jobs. Would this be an opportunity to also introduce a universal basic in income? A, a question for Kate. So consumption is jobs. Yes, because when one person is buying something, it's somebody else's livelihood. And 
what we consume really matters. So whether we're consuming single-use plastics um, and goods and services that are highly polluting is very different kind of consumption and creates very different kinds of jobs than whether we are consuming products that have been refurbished and remade and reused and restyled. And that can happen within the city. And of course, this is part of the circular economy. Again, Amsterdam's just today launched its uh, circular policy of becoming a fully circular city by 2050. I love that because nobody knows what on earth it means to be a fully circular city by 2050. That's a moonshot of a policy goal. Let me bring it to the question of uh, incomes. Do we need a universal basic income? Certainly, uh, we need to secure everybody's ability to could participate in markets because markets are one of the most fundamental ways that incomes, uh, that, that people meet their wants and needs. And actually, I think there's a real, I just want to show something here. <laughs> So I have my favorite piece of hose pipe that I'm often using. So many people's incomes depend upon a circular flow of money between consumption and wages and consumption and wages. One person buys a, something in a cafe, the cafe owner then spends it in a class, spends it on some shoes, spends it in a yoga class, spends it in education, spends it in healthcare, and the money goes round and round. But some people, not all this money goes round and round, some of it gets siphoned off here. And it goes down this funnel <laughs> and it goes into the funnel that I'm going to call the funnel of rent. We're going in chemistry class now. Or, or, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we're going into a political economy class <laughs> yeah, yeah. because some money gets funneled off to pay for rent, yeah. landlords, landowners, mortgages, interest. And this is what's called the rentier economy. The, the, the economist John Stuart Mill back in the 1850s, he said the rentier makes his money as if he were asleep. And he makes that money merely by owning the capacity to withdraw it. So owning the land, owning the house, owning the power to create money. What I really think is happening now is a split between people whose incomes have suddenly dried up because, they, because we can no longer go to markets and buy each other's goods and services, and the rentier economy that still wants its 5%, 10%. And the really interesting thing that's happening in some countries, uh, in the UK, there's debates over should we have a rent freeze? Should we have a, okay. a, a freeze on rent increases? Should we actually have mortgage holidays? And so we're beginning to see a separation and we can see more visibly the, the economy of circulating incomes and the economy of strac extracting incomes. And this is a profoundly political moment where we need to notice the difference between these two forms of the economy because this is the where the 1% really makes its money. So to me, that is the fundamental that we begin to see. Now, if people give them basic incomes and they all just go off to the rentier economy, that's not doing the work that needs to be done. Okay. So not just basic incomes, let's separate this expectation of endless rent. Thanks. Last question for this uh, uh, part of the panel discussion to uh, Sa Saada uh, from Ice Cube. Uh, the online consumption is rising the unprecedented. <laughs> yeah, the one and only. Um, what does this say about the consumption culture in combination with the deep rootedness of neoliberalism? Sorry, I didn't get the beginning of the question. Um, well, online well, there's a lot of online consumption at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, what does this say about the consumption culture in combination with the deep rootedness of neoliberalism? Doesn't this mean we will easily go back to the old situation and consumption culture will radicalize even more? I think Ice Cube is uh, spot on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. I, I mean, like I said, I'm not. Uh, I don't predict. You know, I don't. I don't do predictions. But I think. Um, yeah. Um, it's not easy for us to to change our identity as consumers. I think it's an identity question, and um, um, you know, uh, and also the fact that we are part of capitalism, um, and none of us are. You know, if it's not just us as consumers, but also the people uh, providing the goods, uh, producing the goods, we're all caught in that system. And one little shock is not going to change that. I'm not saying this this shock is little, but I'm saying that um, it takes much more for us to change and shift our identities. And, and if you're saying we need to we need to change a narrative, would uh, could the donut narrative be be uh, uh, helpful in your, uh, pers from uh, your perspective? Well, uh, I, I'm not sure if I understand the donut narrative completely, but um, you were talking about the funnels, and one of the funnels I'm missing actually is that of uh, the city of Amsterdam and the country of Holland as a tax haven. Um, this is a funnel that I think is bigger maybe even than the funnel you just uh, uh, showed. 
And um, so for me, talking about changing the narrative is also about who gets to tell this story, who gets to hand uh, hand out solutions who gets to be in the forefront and gets the talking stick uh, to say this is this way this is the way we're going this is um, um, this is the new design for our future um, we are all all of us in this studio it's not many people uh, uh, Kate yourself too we're speaking from a place of privilege the people in the documentary are spe we're speaking from a from a place of privilege uh, Lidavai uh, Edelkort mm -hmm. uh, I think I, I was a bit annoyed with the, with the uh, episode as well because um, why would you go all the way to the tip of the of the African continent to the and then to speak to to a Dutch woman um, and her reality when you can talk to people in South Africa preferably uh, people from indigenous communities that have a completely different uh, relationship to living and to maybe to the planet or, or, or to, you know, how to be a person. I think we are so conditioned uh, to being consumers that, like I said, I don't have much faith in the biggest and newest ideas, sorry, Kate, coming from this side of the world because we have too much interest in the status quo. Thanks. Point taken for a short reflection, Kate, and then we go to the second clip of, uh, of this program. Oh, um, great point. I didn't realize that uh, the woman being interviewed was in the tip of Africa. That's, that does seem bizarre to me to go so far and find a white Dutch woman to talk. Uh, I completely agree with Sarah's points. Uh, whether an idea from this part of the world can have resonance, um, I just say, let's see what happens. I know that the tool that we're creating will unearth all of these questions, Amsterdam uh, as a tax haven, ownership, finance. It, it requires places to go deep within and ask quite difficult questions about their own design. So let's just see how the tool runs. Okay. Let's go to uh, uh, our next part of the of the uh, panel, Inequalities and Solidarity, uh, introduced by the second clip. Psychiatrist Dirk de Wachter welcomes the current rise of solidarity as a deeply felt human value. However, he fears it will diminish after the crisis. Zou het ook zo kunnen zijn dat nu mensen ervaren hoe fijn het eigenlijk is om iets voor een ander te kunnen betekenen... dat ze misschien ook daarna iets soberder, iets minder gedreven... door onmiddellijke ja, gratificatie. Dat is een mooi idee. Uh, ik zal u eerlijk zeggen, ik maak mij daar niet te veel illusies over. Hè. Ik ben blij dat er wat solidariteit ontstaat tussen mensen. En ik vind dat goed. En dat bewijst ook dat dat een heel diep menselijke waarde is. Maar ik vrees wel een beetje als alles voorbij is dat we heel snel terug in onze consumptionistische, hedonistische, heel erg doordrammende samenleving terechtkomen. Hoor. En dat dat ook door de economie zal gevraagd worden. We zullen moeten consumeren om terug de productie aan te vatten en onze wegwerpcultuur uh, vorm te geven. Dat denk ik wel. Nu, nu ben ik niet zo positief, mijn excuses daarvoor. Dat denk ik wel. Maar goed, er blijft altijd toch wel die onderstroom van solidariteit die als het dan echt nodig is en er is miserie, dan toch ook zijn werk doet. Dat is het mooie van die, van die boodschap. talking about um, how can we combat the inequalities exposed by the crisis and how can we allow current solidarity to continue after the crisis. If you have quest questions at home, please ask them via the Q&A uh, um, uh, application in Zoom. Uh, Saada, going to you first. Um, do you recognize that rise of solidarity uh, in the Netherlands and maybe also in an international context? Um, uh, I think it is visible in uh, on people's personal level. Um, in the sense of, you know, like I said, reevaluating uh, your relationship to the people in your life, your neighbors, uh, your your maybe you know your coworkers, um, uh, relatives, things like that. Um, and um, we all saw, and I think Kate, this also happened in the UK. Our government, um, or our, our uh, I think our prime minister, is saying that we should applaud people, uh, caretakers, uh, people who now are on what they call the front lines. I think the the war language is also very interesting. Um, but um, 
I don't really see that on an international yeah. level. I think if we even look at the people, um, uh, you know, that are politically responsible for everything, uh, Wopke Hoekstra, um, um, who, who kind of said, well, I'm sorry, Italy, but uh, we're not going to bail you out of this uh, crisis. This is your problem. So you're missing it on the European scale. So in an even more global scale, you say you are not seeing it at all. No, because like I said, I think people don't really see the connections yet. Um, and I think this is where media comes in. What type of stories are we telling? Which people are telling those stories? Who are the people, um, like I said, who are um, uh, put in front of the camera uh, to explain what has been going on? Um, um, the people that, you know, like I said, from, from the global south, yeah. uh, their mm -hmm. experiences, not just now, right? And media has a, has a vital role here? Definitely, yes. I think uh, I'm very disappointed in our national media at the at the moment. Uh, when you look at pre press conferences around uh, this crisis, the questions being asked to me are so futile. Uh, they're so they're so I don't know. I don't, it doesn't hit any critical uh, chord, or it doesn't really um, it doesn't ask questions that expand our borders uh questions that i mean um talk about solidarity uh, holland has decided not to uh take in children from the refugee camps from in greece this is a decision from our government so how do you expect uh, a country a people to uh extend the solidarity they have on a personal level um to other people that they might not know Okay. So I yeah I'm I don't mean to be uh, the the um, you know bitter cynical here but uh, yeah this solidarity is very it's on a very micro level if you, if you ask me okay Marlene how do you look at this solidarity rise and 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 also maybe helped with with uh, uh, new technologies being implemented do do you uh, do you uh, are you hopeful with these uh, tendencies yeah I'm I'm a little bit um, troubled by um, what's the Psychiatrist, I, I forgot his name. Said Dirk de Wachter, the, the Nick Cave uh, yeah. impersonator. Um, uh, sorry, um, that he said, well, we that will go back to normal uh, soon, fast, and as if that's our natural way of being to be not solidar to, to not feel uh, solidarity. And I, I think we really have to look at this uh, from a systemic perspective and saying what. What is what is learned to us is that we have to compete, that we have to be rich, that we have to that we have to be afraid for our well-being uh, because it, that our that somebody else's well-being can be at our own cost. So this is what this is our culture, how we learn this kind of stuff. So yeah, so it, I think um, I agree with what you already said is that it will take a lot of time, and not just only this crisis. Uh, that we have to relearn uh, what uh, is re what really matters, and I, I think some people get it and and suddenly feel that oh yeah, we need the public sector. So it was, it's not just all market driven. Uh, right. we, we, when when it's when it's when it's crisis, we need uh, the critical jobs. People that are on the the front line are the people that we were less interested in. They, so so I think there's a little change. Um, But I hope, I, I still believe that people are cooperative by nature because we need each other. This is how we survive. Okay. It's and taking we, a question. we de-learn it because of the systematic, uh, the systems that surround us, the competitiveness that is there. And if we don't feel comfortable in ourselves, we don't feel how to to be open and solidarity with other people. So yeah, but I, there's I think a systemic question. I think it also challenges ideas around, it needs to be bigger than just uh you know our our care system or 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 our economy or our livelihoods it needs to challenge ideas around nation states around borders things like that i mean this virus doesn't care about borders mm -hmm. this is the biggest confrontation with that i think so moving forward how do we move forward together do you think the Can length of the crisis you know, just question and also uh, taking into uh, a question from Monique does the length of the crisis make make change more is there a correlation between the length of the crisis and the and the and the, the possible uh, um, well positive outcome of, of effective change do, do you think that a deeper crisis will maybe make change more um, well likely to happen Marlene? Well, if if we act on on the ideas that are already there, uh, which is um, having another idea about production and consu consu consumption, 
um, this whole idea about uh, hyper local, so that you have local to local perspective, but uh, but you are in an international global environment. So not g going back to your only your own uh, only for yourself, but being in 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 connection. Uh, that really could be uh, the way to go. I think I think we all have the ideas how it could work on a global scale for everyone, not just here in the West. Uh, but then we have to believe this system. We have to. I, I, I was always say we need to change the spreadsheet. We need to to rethink what is value and what is. And I think what Kate learns us. I think this was a great uh, again um, lesson you just gave about what is extractive and was and what is regenerative. And we are in a very extractive model at the moment, and we have to get rid of it. And and we have to be clear that when we spend public funding, that has to be part of the. The reason you should not give it to extractive economies. We should give it to the economies that are regenerative and and don't exploit people or planet. So I think we are in a very good moment for to do this. And this is this this is a, per, a planetary perspective. This is not just a local perspective. Okay, Kate, how do you see uh, uh, policymakers actually implementing uh, the right policies in order to also uh, uh, support solidarity in the longer run? So. I agree with a lot of what's been said by both Marlene and Sayada. Uh, we see policy, so let me start with the positive examples. We've seen China sending medics and supplies to Italy. We've seen uh, Cuba sending medics to Italy. So we've seen some uh, moments of international cooperation which get press and they get coverage and applause. And I absolutely agree with Sayada that there is missing a global perspective. We actually have inherited an era of nation state economics. So if we go all the way back to ancient Greece, economics began, it literally means the art of household management. And it began at the level of the individual household, a rich man's estate. And then it went to the level of a city state. And it was Adam Smith 200 years ago who took it to the level of the nation state and why does one nation thrive while another languishes? And he wrote this famous book, The Wealth of Nations. And we have inherited nation state economics. We measure economic metrics by the matrix of a nation. What is your nation's GDP? What is your nation's growth rate? What is your nation's inflation rate and, un and unemployment rate? And I think we're stuck there. And it means we get nation state politics as well. And all of the crises that are occurring now in the 21st century, be it a financial crisis, a pandemic like the coronavirus, climate change, and indeed global inequality, these are transnational crises that no one country can control alone. So my nation and Brexit and the idea of take back control is an absurdity in the 21st century. You cannot take back control. We are part of a global complex system. And I think what needs to happen is we move from this nation state economics to a planetary scale economics and recognize the deep interconnectedness of nations. And then nations will have to confront the very tough questions like the one Sayada is raising, like borders and migration and transnational solidarity in tackling pandemics. But we have not yet learned to do this. Okay, thanks. Let's uh, uh, introduce the next uh, clip and uh, take uh, going to the value or the notion of freedom. In our uh, third clip, Dirk de Wachter, psychiatrist, thinks the government has a big role to play to make sure that after the crisis, uh, large groups of society are not left behind in a structural way. So we're going to talk about this bigger role of uh, government in uh, the modern, uh, the the next society. Maar moest de overheid nu, want nu is men toch wel uh, zeer toeschietelijk naar, naar de burger toe, wat ik goed vind, moest men dat kunnen behouden? Moest men na de crisis ook een sociaal beleid kunnen blijven voeren? Economisch verantwoord, maar toch sociaal. Dat zou een goede zaak zijn. En ik doe geen partijpolitieke uitspraken, hoor. Maar ik bedoel, als men zou kunnen zien dat... Dat, die, dat gat dat economisch geslagen wordt, dat dat niet heel snel kan opgevuld, maar dat dat een, een trage fase moet hebben waarin dat zoveel mogelijk mensen in het sociale weefsel kunnen meegenomen worden. Hè? Dat er niet te veel snelheid wordt genomen waardoor dat mensen uit de boot dreigen te vallen. 
Ik weet niet of ik mij goed uitdruk sociologisch. Hè. Dat zal toch de opdracht voor, van de overheid zijn, hè, van de financiële sector en van de bedrijvenssector. Hè. Hoe kunnen we na de crisis dat economisch debakkel herstellen zonder een sociaal bloedbad? Dat gaat de uitdaging zijn na de crisis. Okay, talking about this notion of freedom uh, and how does the corona crisis uh, make us think about that? Um, well, role of the government is increasing uh, to uh, make us uh, to keep us healthy. Uh, actually, yesterday the Dutch government gave a press conference uh, introducing two new apps. They have to be built yet. Uh, uh, Marlene, uh, your thoughts on that? J just for a quick introduction. Um, There's one app to register if someone has been close to a corona-affected person, and a second app would monitor the symptoms of corona patients. Uh, of course, all privacy should be okay, but uh, uh, still, what are your thoughts on that, Marlene? Well, today we released uh, a statement from a lot of people that are concerned about the privacy issues here and about the wrong type of control that could be possible when you uh, make this... Um, um, that everybody has to have this app and you're not allowed to be on the street if you not ha have an app, which is in some some countries they, they have this kind of uh, enforcement, which is really, really uh, scary. Um, so you can find it on uh, veilig-tegen-corona.nl, uh, uh, the URL, it's just released. Um, now I think that it, it this again, um, there, therefore I still I think this is not time to go knitting because we have to be very careful. But can you say that a bit more about these conditions that, that has, have been yeah, released? Because, yeah, if it, the, 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 there is maybe, um, it's, it, 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 we could help people to be on the street again when we know more about if we are in contact with people that have been uh, at Corona or, or, or have the virus. Uh, this is proximity uh, tracing. You can do this with a mobile phone, with Bluetooth. Um, it's not proven yet. I mean, there's there's some... Uh, uh, Singapore worked with it, but they had to conclude that this was not enough. So they had to also have other measurements. But it, the, the, the idea, it's not the reason... I think when you do it, you have to be really, really clear that it is decentralized, it's encrypted, there is, it is public open source, there is a public oversight for it. It's not part of the private sector. So there are a lot of a lot of things that has to be in place. And if it's public, you, you say it's it. built by public institutions, the data should be controlled and in, in, uh, in property, in, in, in uh, ownership of, of public institutions, that sort of thing. Yeah, no centralized databases. So th this can be a decentralized uh, solution, it can be encrypted. So there are a lot of technical details here which we describe um, in more detail, but it has to be anonymous. And there has no, th there should not be uh, a place where all the data is captured uh, either by private or by a government. It is possible, that, but then this has to be the requirements. And I don't see it explicitly enough. There is a European initiative that also tells uh, governments now to, to make it decentralized if they go uh, and, and build apps. Um, but there's also the idea that we have a, a passport, which then tells us if we are f virus free or in which uh, green, red or, or yellow. Uh, again, this can be very, very dangerous. Uh, uh, so at the, at the short run, it gives the idea that we can be free, we can open, we can be in the streets again. But on the middle or long run, it can mean that you're not allowed to work, that you're not allowed to, to go uh, do sh shopping. Uh, and, that you ha and that people try to get the virus because otherwise they're not allowed to, to be on the street. So it can have very negative effects. Yeah. Can these two uh, sides merge in something that is workable in the sense that is there a real contradiction between either privacy or, or a healthy uh, uh, society? And if you want a he healthy society, we have to give her privacy and the other way around? Or is there a no, way we could work in the middle? No, these are false uh, uh, oppositions. So you can do, you can use technology, but uh, and you have to build privacy in the system itself, and then you can uh, be safe and and privacy protected. But um, I don't see enough um, uh, uh, actions towards that. So that's why we also uh, send this message. If the government is not securing this then we, I would oppose those kind of uh, applications. I really think that this is, this is an Helen, Helen's flock. I'm not sure how to say it yeah. in English, but it's, it brings us in a, in a totalitar totalitarian state where the control is with the government. And we, have, we call it an intelligent lockdown, which means that it, it tells that we as citizens have our responsibility. And I think if you tell us that we are responsible, we can act upon it. If at the moment that the government feels that we are not responsible, they have to act. 
then then you lose the idea of of, of the the fundamental freedom uh, that I think is constitutional for our democracy. Thanks. Okay, your reflections on a larger uh, role of uh, of the government within this uh, uh, society after Corona crisis. Well, I very much listen to Marlene as the person I learn from about these things. So I'm so glad she's there in Amsterdam, not knitting, but uh, weaving the future that we want to weave in the digital world. And when I reflect on, I mean, I don't just want to reflect here on government, but reflecting on any kind of institution, any kind of organization, um, it, I think it's always crucial to ask yourself, whether it's a company or a government or a data, data company, what is its purpose? How is it governed? Who has voice? Crucially, how is it owned? And therefore, how is it financed? And if you can answer these questions about the design of the institution or the technology and how it's owned and financed, you will understand so much about how it's being put to work. And this brings us back to the city donut that I was talking about, the city of Amsterdam. We also need to ask of the city, what is the city's purpose? How is it governed, owned, and financed? Now, on the question of the role of government, there's whole areas around information and control of information and what that information is being used to do over citizens. But there's a whole other debate around the provision of healthcare, the provision of, say, a basic income and income security, the provision of secure housing. And these are crucial public goods and roles of the state that have been rolled back over the last 40 years through the neoliberal agenda. And I think it's an amazing opportunity to realize, actually, we make our states incredibly, our, our societies incredibly vulnerable to uh, shocks like this and to people losing so much their homes and their livelihoods and their health all at once. And so actually we're seeing states step back in. And I think in an era where we realize we are prone to shocks, if we don't pull back our impact on the planet, we need a greater role of that collective interest of collective health care, of public and social housing, of a, a basic income to secure people's rights. So it's a very, very interesting pushback of events against the presumptions and the philosophy of neoliberalism. Thanks, Sada. Your uh, reflections on on the possibilities of having a, a sort of a safe society and and using privacy by design as a way of of, of uh, keeping our autonomy and freedom. I think haven't we already given up? I mean, Marlene, you're you're knowledgeable on this, but haven't we already given up a lot of our freedom already? I mean, all three of us are here sitting with our devices, and we're traceable. We're you know, I don't think there are any secrets between me and. Mark Rutte, or oh, can I? Or are there? Yeah, please. Oh. That's that's my that's what I think. No, of course. I mean, this uh, I, we definitely gave too much power, too much data, too much information to companies that uh, we don't even know how to govern. Uh, uh, and and so yeah, so we we live in a surveillance capitalist state at the moment, an information capitalist state. Um, but we can push back there as well. So I don't, I don't see that as a given. I see that as as something that you have to... Get. For 25 years, we, we just let it go. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it has to be like that. So the moment that we realize that this is not a society that we want, that we don't want to have this kind of companies have the type of information, that we put our, our legal structures in place. Uh, and, and so then I think we have to push back on the surveillance uh, in our technologies, on, on all the information. If it's in the, in, the, in, the, in the infrastructure, the telecom, the hardware, the software, the applications. Um, and we have to spend our money on technology that doesn't surveil us. So, um, so that especially now when we are going to build Corona apps, we should learn from the past and say we are not going to work with Google, we're not going to work with the the, the big tech, uh, we're not going to rely on their data. They should not have that data in the first place. But now so, that so, 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 so we're going to build this in a way that it, that it, 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 there's a, the the, the uh, um, democracy oversight on it. It's, it has public values in it. And there is, it's not part of an extractive market. But is it, uh, I mean, can we, is it reversible? They already have our data, right? The people living now. Yeah, we can, yeah I'm, I'm, I don't know if we can reverse what's there, but we can start from new and say, we are going to build for our digital future on technologies that we can trust. And the moment that we're going to spend our money that, that way, and we put our legal position in place, and we break up big tech, we open up a whole new market. 
we, we, we create a, a lot of opportunities. Okay, so these could European be actually best practices right for thing. future apps to be built in, 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 in a good way. Yeah, so we should not now, uh, this is this is again why it's a critical moment when, when governments are going to rely on Google to, to fight Corona, we're doing really the wrong thing. Because at the moment I feel that there is a, a sort of like a, a shift mm. in thinking that we also have, we need technologies that have public values inside and that are optimizing for social value and not for uh, the value of shareholders. And I think okay. so, so this is a good moment actually to, 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 to put our money where our mouth is. I have a question by Henry uh, to Kate. Um, also with some technical uh, 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 effects, but he's talking about the danger of the repetition of a virus pandemic and the enormous effect on the economy. Don't we have to change the econo economic system into one that is b better at enduring lockdowns? Perhaps that urgency can help by preventing going back to business as usual. Do you have any ideas on the new system that's really sort of a lockdown economy that would still work, but really from a, from a point of a lockdown? Oh, there is so much uh, packed into that question. Yeah. Uh, so I hope we don't live lives of a lockdown economy. Uh, the, the fundamental instinct of the human being is to meet, to socialize, to meet others. That's why we find this so hard. And, and in the UK, they often call it social distancing, but it's not. It's physical distancing and people are doing everything they can to socialize, like coming to a meetup online like this, because we actually crave the, the connection with other human beings. So I don't want to accept a lockdown economy. I want to maybe bring this to a point about resilience. So uh, people are saying we need to be more resilient. There are going to be more pandemics or indeed more crises happening. We, we already had crises with, before this financial. There's probably another one coming. We have climate crises. We have global crises of inequality that are causing, causing migration crises and distress migration. So we have, some people say we need to be more resilient and there's two kinds of resilience I just want to think of. One, there's a kind of deal with it resilience, which is the world is, is unstable and shaking. You deal with it, take it on the chin, as the UK prime minister said a few months ago, perhaps we'll just take it on the chin. This is absolutely unacceptable because the pressure it puts on individuals and families and communities can break them as we are seeing in place after place. We need a very different kind of resilience, which is what I call design for it resilience. We need to create a more resilient global system. So one reason this pandemic spread so fast is because humans have come to think it's normal to travel so frequently. You know, in July last year, there were over 230,000 flights in a day on planet Earth. 230,000 airplanes took off. I think we've just seen peak connection. I think we need to think very hard about whether we really all need to be flying everywhere all the time. And so for me, part of the resilience and the transformation we need is not lockdown, but less incessant connection, which often is driven actually by business or people thinking that it's normal to take an Easter holiday in Thailand when you live in Amsterdam or London. So. I think I don't want to live in a lockdown economy. I want to live in deeply connected economies. I think we will see relocalized economies. And actually, we have the technologies that can enable that with 3D printing, with Creative Commons licensing, distributive design. And that has huge implications for people in countries where the production is currently happening, that they lose their livelihood through those global supply chains. And so a huge attention needs to be placed upon what that means for their own futures too. So that's a very, very big question with a lot of possibilities wrapped up in it. Thanks. Going back and uh, going to the final two, two to three uh, minutes for this uh, for this uh, discussion, I have a, a question from Henry uh, again to Sara and uh, Kate. Uh, Kate, you earlier mentioned uh, production and consumption uh, becoming more closely linked. Uh, international uh, production chains becoming shorter. Uh, production taking place more nationally or, or within a continent. Uh, what do you believe are the implications of that for all those families in the global south who are currently dependent on an international uh, dependent on an international market? And, and, and would probably lose the markets in, 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 uh, in the West if, if we would uh, localize our production uh, to more uh, uh, local uh, um, dimensions. Sada. Okay, this is a question for me. Um, yeah, this is tricky. I think... Um, I with think a look on the clock, please, because we have one and a half ah, minutes okay. left. So please yeah, make it short and tricky. sweet. I don't, have a, I don't have a conclusive answer uh, for that. I think we, uh, when, when thinking of you know, radical change, we need to take uh, in consideration people's livelihoods and how we have designed their livelihoods connected to our consumerism. So I think 
I don't have a real answer to that. I think it's uh, that's not something you have you can disrupt uh, f uh, tomorrow. Um, on another level, I think we should also create economies that are sustainable in other places that are not just focused on consumerism in one part of the world. So how can we uh, produce in a way that is locally and globally uh, without it being uh, damaging to the earth and damaging to uh, to people and, and, and explo exploitative towards people? Okay. Uh, I don't have the answer to, for that, but I, th I do think it's a very valid question that I find... It's a dilemma. Thanks. Yeah. These are our closing remarks uh, for now. I would like to thank our panel, Kate Rayworth. Thanks a lot for joining us, Sarah Norisen and Marlene Sticker. Uh, cheers. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot also for joining us uh, from wherever you are, your digital presence. Uh, a short look on uh, future programs at uh, Parkhuizen Zwijger. Monday, April 20, um, uh, Kate Rayworth will be discussing with our elderman, uh, Marieke van Doornik, about the implementation of the donut in Amsterdam. So please uh, look at that. And next week, we will look at Watching the Rich, Kijken naar de Rijken Sunday evening on Dutch television and the meetup on Wednesday evening April 15. Hope to see you then. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.